folks, Tom Vassell here, and welcome back to Best of Publishers. Now, today we're taking a look at a publisher that actually changed its name uh, from Warfrog to Treefrog. So I'm putting them together, Warfrog slash Treefrog. Uh, the Warfrog was bringing forth the idea of, of war, and so Treefrog was a better name because not every game from the company was about war. Uh, I think every game from this company was from Martin Wallace, although Martin Wallace has designed games from other companies. Warfrog was his own publishing house and then morphed to Treehouse, Treefrog. And then as time went by, Treefrog became a design studio, although they've just announced their last game. So this is another publisher that is no more, at least will be very soon. Now, Martin Wallace has done many games through Warfrog Treefrog to have gotten a lot of buzz over the years. Although most of them, if, if you're watching and you're new to gaming, you probably haven't heard of most of them because they certainly are enthusiasts. They have their enthusiasts, especially one specific game in particular. But for the most part, there's just not a lot of, uh, you know, they haven't had the longevity amongst main gamers. Although if you talk to a hardcore Euro gamer, many of these games will likely be on their favorite list. So here are my 10 favorite games from Warfrog slash Treefrog. We'll start with number 10 which is After the Flood. Now, what's interesting about After the Flood uh, is it, that it's an exactly three-player game. There's not many games out there, and I actually don't recommend that you make a game like this, which is about, you know, this ancient times and building empires and things like that. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an interesting game, and I like it, but it's exactly three players, which could be kind of a negative thing. But this came out, I don't know, so many years ago, and he was, he was experimenting. I, I, if I remember correctly, this is not the only only three-player game that he did, but I really do like the theme. It's after, it, it, it's it's early, you know, Mesopotamia-type history after the flood. Number nine, Tinner's Trail. Now, again, one of the things that Morton Wallace puts in his games is a lot of history, and Tinner's Trail was one of those. I mean, part of the game was was about eating pasties, and I didn't even know anything about it, but I learned a little bit. Uh, as you collect these different, uh, it's, you know, kind of a mining game and taking control of different things. There's some auctioning in this game to get the resources you need, action selection, a lot of his typical mechanisms, but they came together in a decent game, Tinner's Trail. Number eight, some people will probably yell at me for having this game so low in my top 10, but it is what it is, and that is Age of Steam. Now, this is by far the most popular game on this list. It's the one that's gotten the most buzz. Age of Steam was the beginning, or it wasn't the beginning, but it was the turning point in his train games that he designed. This was the one that really got people's attention. And after this, he, he Glenn Drover and him made a Railroad Tycoon, and then there was just Steam from Mayfair, but Age of Steam has like at least, and I'm not exaggerating, at least 30 maps for it, uh, maps of all sorts of things all over the world, but this idea of delivering goods from one place to the other, a very deep, involved game, very little luck. Uh, the way the goods came out was luck, but other than that, straight strategy, a lot of stuff in the game. For me, it's dipped over the years because it is a tough game, and if you play with new players, they're not going to know what's going on because there's a, a, a pretty fierce auction in it, but it is, you, you can't deny that this game is a great game, Age of Steam. Number seven is Pericles. Pericles is another historical game about ancient Greece. And in this game, you are controlling the different city-states, and sometimes you are defending them, and sometimes you are attacking them. So the players are controlling the attackers and defenders throughout all the different city-states in ancient Greece. I actually really thought this was a fun game. There's a lot going on in it. It's a little sometimes weird to wrap your head around where you are and what side you're on, but this is not the only time he has done this in a game. In fact, I'll mention another one about it shortly but that is Pericles. Number six is Struggle of Empires. Struggle of Empires is kind of his colonialism game, maybe. I wouldn't say dudes on a map game because it's a little too abstracted for that, but as players have their different, uh, you know, empires and they're kind of taking over different colonies, there's a combat system in it, one of the more unusual ones where you're rolling a dice and then subtracting one die from the other die. Uh, but this led to uh, uh, some other games uh, Conquest of Empires from Eagle Griffin, which I thought was better than this one, although I'm probably in the minority about that, but Struggle of Empires was a big, sweeping, not too long of a game, but still pretty meaty, colonialist game, Struggle of Empires. Number five, Discworld, Ankh Morkpork. Now, this is one that actually Mayfair picked up, but was originally from the Tree Frog Studios, and this one is based on the Discworld series. Um, it's a silly game, but 
offers some pretty good choices in this game. Each person has a secret goal that they are trying to do and controlling the different areas of Discworld. It has a lot of the humor from the series in it, uh, but at the same time, offers some pretty solid choices. There's a lot of games based in uh, Terry Pratchett's universe. This is probably the best one. That is Discworld Ankh Morpork, and I just like saying the name. Number four is Steel Driver. Steel Driver is another train game, although this one is closer to a stock market train game. Now, one of the things, I think Steel Driver would actually be higher on my list if it just didn't look so blah. There's a lot of cubes and stuff. You'll, and, and that's one of the features of Tree Frog, War Frog. They were never games that when you looked at them, you were like, amazing. Now, nah, there's just a lot of colored cubes and discs and things around the board. And um, Steel Driver is no exception to that, but it is a pretty solid game of building railroad routes across America and the stock market involved there. Number three is A Few Acres of Snow, Martin Wallace's take on deck building. Uh, he makes a little war game here, uh, the French versus the English, uh, up in Canada, and you are, are, are playing cards and building a deck to fight each other. This one has gotten a lot of controversy over the years because apparently there is a broken strategy involved with the game that they tried to fix, but then someone found a way around that. I don't know anything about that strategy. I never found it. So for me, the game is fine. Uh, but I really did enjoy it a lot, and that is A Few Acres of Snow. Number two is The Princes of the Renaissance. Now this game, if I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, is going to be reprinted this year. And this one is a very deep game. And it's another one where sometimes you're the attacker and sometimes you're the defender and different things. And I remember just really enjoying this one. Now this one might be hazy memories because it's been over a decade since I've played the game. But I'm really pumped about it coming back. Uh, for me, this was one of my introductions to Martin Wallace. And I was like, ooh, this is really cool. What's going to be next? I can't wait to see how he puts all this stuff together. And again, a very strong historical flavor. Princess of the Renaissance. And number one, my favorite game that he makes is about the French Revolution. More history. Uh, and that is L Liberté. Liberté is a really kind of crazy, chaotic looking game, right? There's three different factions in France. And you are trying to work and control the different factions and get points that way. And most points win. Send people off in battles. But there could be a revolution at any point, And it doesn't matter how many points you have. If you control the... You know, the revolutionists, the radicals in the revolution, you'll win, but there could also be a counter-revolution, and you can win that way. So there's three different ways to win the game. You're never really out of it. You could be behind in points. You're like, forget that. We're going for the revolution, and I like that. I think that's a cool concept. And again, I think the game's really intriguing because it seems super chaotic, but it's not. I have a hard time playing this one these days because it's, a lot of people don't like it. It feels almost over-the-top chaotic to them, but I think that there's more control there than you actually see. And I love the theming. I think the French Revolution comes out very strongly in it. So, Mart Wallace and Tree Frog, War Frog. A lot of history in their games. There's games are certainly very, very rarely. I mean, I think there's a few games on here we would consider light. Maybe Discworld Hunk Morkpork. And that one was kind of went from Mayfair anyway. But for the most part, his games are very involved. There's a lot going on in them. And there's probably a lot that I did not mention. And you're like, why didn't he mention that game? Tell me in the comments what your favorite Tree Frog, War Frog games are. And until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. And this has been Best of Publishers, Tree Frog slash War Frog. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.